Welcome to our special webinar commemorating International Women's Day. I am Sonia Dhami and I'm joining you from Fremont, California. And I'm Rav Singh and I'm joining you from London, UK. Hello Rav. Oh, yeah. This is an occasion for us to acknowledge, honor, commemorate and celebrate all the women on whose shoulders we stand today. In the next hour, we will share with you some unique stories of some of these remarkable women, which include Maharani Jind Kaur, Princess Sophia Dalip Singh, Kirpal Kaur Sandhu, Banno Pandai, Amrita Shergil, Princess Indira Devi, Maharani Prem Kaur, and the revolutionary Gulab Kaur. And finally, a tribute to the incredible women who are in the front lines of the Indian farmers' protest. The slogan which defines this year's celebrations is choose to challenge. And the women we talk about today have done that in their lives in one way or another. But before we begin, I would like to remind you uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat box that you see on the screen on the side. If you have any comments, we welcome those as well. And I would request you to please share this uh, recording, this live session, uh, which will be recorded and available later as well. So please share this live recording with your friends and network by clicking the share button which you see on your screen. And before we begin, I would like to give a shout out to all the five amazing awardees who were honored with the Nirpa Awards from the Sikh Foundation during its 50th anniversary celebrations. Thank you, Arpanaji, Dr. Nikki Guninder Kaur, Susan Strong, Dr. Anarkali Honaryar, and Valerie Kaur you continue to inspire us. And celebrating Women's Day should not just be something only women do. Real success is when both men and women will claim it as their history. I'm glad that we have Rav Singh from the UK join us in these celebrations. His research for his insightful tours places historical figures in the actual physical spaces. And this is what turns history into a tangible experience. And he has done the same for today's presentation as well. So Rav, should we start with the indomitable Maharani Jind Kaur? Yes, let's go, let's start. Yeah, let's go. So I'd like also again remind our audiences to please uh, click the share button so we can spread the love and uh, allow your friends and other networks to join us. So Rav, can we have the next? Perfect, perfect. This is the stunning portrait of Mah the Maharani painted in 1863 by the artist George Richmond in London. Now the artist has impressively captured her beauty, her daring and defiance, which is the stuff of legends and folklore. She is shown wearing a blue and gold dress adorned with her fabulous jewels. But at the time of this portrait, she was almost blind with cataract and plagued with ill health. Sadly, she died a year later at the young age of 46. To me, it is so interesting, the fact that she is known to have reluctantly sat for this portrait. While on the other hand, it is through this portrait that she is alive in our collective memories today. For me, this is a very important painting, not because of her royal stature or its antiquity or its value, but because this is the painting that brings her story alive for us. And going forward, it underlines to me the need for us to commission paintings 
from our contemporary artists, the living artists of women who have inspired us in our lives, in our families, in our communities, both as a tribute to them or to acknowledge their role in shaping history. So do think about how each one of us can shape and preserve these fascinating stories of women from our past and present, because this is how we will live and continue to inspire our future generations. And Rav, I hand it over to you for some interesting juicy bits of information about the Maharani during her brief stay in London. Thank you very much, Sonia. So she, um, Maharani Jind Gaur is recorded as the first Sikh woman in the UK. She arrived here in 1861 and she challenged the British Empire throughout her life. And as you said, it was only when her health was fading that she was allowed to visit England and be with her son, the Maharaja of Lahore, Dilip Singh. Now her fame was derived from the concern she engendered in the British. And she was described as the Messalina of Punjab by the British, who was too rebellious to be controlled. Her story is a story of a great woman, um, both tragic and inspirational in equal measures. She fought to keep alive the royal legacy of her late husband through her son, the Leap Singh. Now she died in London. Um, she died in Kensington at Abingdon House on the morning of the 1st of August, 1863. And for some time, she was laid to rest at this place, the Kensal Green Cemetery in North Kensington. Now I thought it would be interesting to share the remarks of novelist Charles Dickens, who wrote about the Maharani in his weekly journal. So on the 19th of September, 1863, um, he wrote an article which said, I asked to be taken to the dissenter's catacomb that I may see for myself the last resting place of the poor woman whose ashes have been squabbled over and written on by Sikh and Christian. And down here in a coffin covered with white velvet and studded with brass and nails rests the Indian woman whose strong will and bitter enmity towards England caused Lord Dalhousie to say of her when in exile that she was the only person our government near feared. So just moving on now from Maharani Jind Gaur to one of her granddaughters, Sophia. Now Sophia Dalip Singh was the fifth child um, of Maharaja Dalip Singh. Now Dalip Singh and his wife, Bamba Muller, settled in Elverdon in Norfolk, where Sophia was born in 1876. Now, although she had many pursuits and supported many interests, the 1934 Women's Who's Who edition interestingly lists Sophia Dalip Singh's interest as the advancement of women. Now her godmother was Queen Victoria herself. And here she is pictured, pictured on the right here, um, Sophia with her sisters, Bamba and Catherine. And this image is dated 1895 at the debutant's ball. Now, although we can probably spend a lot of time on the Dalip Singh sisters, it's just Sophia that we will focus on today. Now, in 1896, a year after this photo was taken, um, Queen Victoria gifted Sophia Faraday House. Now, Faraday House is shown in the top right of this slide, um, and it's within the Faraday um, Hampton Court complex um, in Richmond in London. Now, Sophia was a keen cyclist, and she was fond of her three dogs, and she often showed off her pets at the Ladies' Kennel Association shows. She was also involved in bringing attention to the contribution of Indian soldiers in the First World War and visited the wounded soldiers in Brighton. She organized flag days to raise money for wounded soldiers where British and Indian women sold little flags decorated with elephants, stars or other objects. And this was used to raise funds for Indian soldiers and really for, to develop like heavy duty uniforms so they could get through the harsh winters of Northern Europe. So she really did play a part as um, part of the British aristocracy. Um, and she was involved in the patronage of Indians in Britain, such as establishing the Lascars Club in the East End of London for seamen who arrived on ships. However, a main activity um, was in the women's suffrage movement. Now she joined the Women's Social and Political Union and became an active member 
um, and a campaigner at the Richmond Surrey branch. She was present at the Women's Parliament, which was held in Caxton Hall, and deputations used to leave after each parliament to protest at the Houses of Parliament nearby. On the 18th of November 1910, she took part in that first deputa deputation to the House of Commons, the Black Friday, with Emily Pankhurst. She also joined the Tax Resistance League, where she refused to pay taxes on the principle that women should not have to pay taxes when they did not have the vote to determine the use of those taxes. Interestingly enough, there was a um, census in 1911, and similar to this month in the UK, we have the March 2021 census, happens every 10 years, but she also stated no vote, no census. As women do not count, they refuse to be counted. I have a conscientious objection to filling up this form. And just to say for those who have the form now, I think the date is the 21st of March to complete your census. So in the next slide here, we see Sophia, and she was the first Sikh to be memorialized on a Royal Mail UK stamp. And this was released 2018 on the 100th anniversary of the Representation of People Act of 1918. And here you see Sophia just outside the boundary of Hampton Court Palace in her mink coat, reflecting her princess um, of the British um, aristocracy and goddaughter of Queen Victoria, but selling the suffrage newspaper revolution, as it states there, now memorialized on a stamp. Um, on that 100th anniversary, um, this statue um, was unveiled in Westminster Square, just um, next to the House of Commons or Parliament. Um, and up until this point, there was no female um, here. So you'll see Nelson Mandela, you'll see Churchill, I think Gandhi is nearby as well, um, but there was no female. So for the 100th anniversary of that Representation of People Act, Millicent Garrett Fawcett, who was a famous suffragette also, um, was unveiled here. And interestingly enough, there are other leading suffragettes, I think 50 in total that are memorialized. And in this corner here, um, you have Sophia the Leap Singh memorialized in Westminster, 100 years after the events that she took part in from nearby Caxton Hall. I'm just gonna hand back to Sonia now for the next slide. Yes, thank you, Rav. So thanks for that um, amazing information. And what I feel is Sophia's story is starting to captivate uh, audiences the world over. And historians and artists are reviving her memory. And a relatively new painting that has caught my eye is uh, this painting by artist Kamal Dhaliwal, who has taken the memory of Sophia and shown us not only who she was or she was born as, but also as what she did. And the artist here, I believe, has been bold and courageous in not pandering to the viewer's expectations of what a painting of a royal lady should be like. So let's look closely at this painting and try to read the symbolism that the artist has included for us to see. We see Sophia as a calm and a resolute young woman. She's dressed in the fashion of the day. And in the background is Hampton Court Palace, which symbolizes the British monarchy. And it was also her residence as Rav mentioned. Uh, so that's a pointer to Sophia's royal status. Now the sky above the palace building is darkened by the smoky fighter planes which are of the World War I vintage. And that gives us an indication of the period in which this painting is placed. As we move our eye down the painting, on the right-hand side, we see the toppled golden throne of her grandfather, Maharaja Ranjit Singh. It is now cast aside by the road, which is an indicator or a reference to Sikh history. Now behind Sophia is the car with the words prime minister partially visible on the number plate. And that is indicating us to the specific incident that happened when prime minister Henry Asquith was leaving 10 Downing Street to hear the speech of the king. 
Now, Sophia was waiting in the crowds outside 10 Downing Street, waiting for an opportune moment. She then hurled herself in front of the prime minister's car and unfurled a banner she was hiding in her fur coat, which read, give women the vote. And that is what we see, which is the red banner, which partially drapes Sophia and is also seen under the front wheel of the painting, which with the words, give women the vote. Now I quote Kamal Dhaliwal, the artist, of his interpretation or his reason of why he's done this painting is, I quote, I, as a portrait painter of Sophia, have tried to portray her personality as a heroic suffragette princess, unquote. And I must say that this painting has changed my visual memory of Sophia. While earlier, whenever I thought of her, an image of a high society woman draped in jewels, ready for a ball would come to my mind, but not anymore. And I thank Kamal Dhaliwal for placing her memory in this perspective. And there are other artists as well who have painted Sophia, including our beloved Singh twins, uh, who are contemporary British artists, but they have an international reputation. And their impressive painting, which is titled Entwined, and you do see this uh, in the background of Rav's screen as well. There is a large um, print behind him. So thank you for including that, Rav. So this, is a, this painting is called The Entwined and it is in the collection of the prestigious Museum of London. It is based on the artist's research of two paintings by a Victorian artist, Henry Nelson O'Neill, and he did these two paintings, which you can see reflective on the right hand side, which is Eastward Ho and Home Again. Now the twins have chosen to place Sophia centrally in this painting, which, show it, which shows her as standing up for women's rights in the early 20th century, as Rav very eloquently shared with us earlier. Surrounding uh, Sophia are other figures which are placed strategically. Some of these are historical figures, while others are, from, uh, are personal to the artist's family. In the background of Sophia is a landscape of London. So the whole painting has been put together and is almost, you can read it like a history lesson. And uh, to really talk about the details of this, we would need an entire show, maybe more to do justice to it. But uh, the point I'm trying to say is that it is with the work of these artists that these characters from our history, which have been buried in the archives, are coming alive and they are forming a part of our visual memories. So with this, I hand over now to Rav. Thank you. Now introducing um, a, a person from more recent history, this is Karpal Kaur Sandhu. Now, Karpal Kaur Sandhu's story is relatively unknown, but um, it's beginning to emerge more and more in, in the last 10 years or so. Now, she served in an area of London called Walthamstow and Leighton, and she joined the actual Metropolitan Police Force on the 1st of February 1971. And what she did was really pave the way for many Asians and women to join the police force. And she in particular proved invaluable as an interpreter and was drafted in to deal with CID cases all over London where a female officer was needed. Now her story starts in East Africa in Zanzibar where she was born in a Sikh family in 1943 and she came to the UK in 1962. Detective Gurbal Ridhi undertook detailed research into her story and the Metropolitan Police Archives, I think he searched through them and began to piece her story together. And he wrote that her chief superintendent at the time wrote that she was proving invaluable with our dealings with the immigrant population. And she's also assisting other divisions in this work and also in teaching police officers Asian dialects. 
Her superintendent added that she was energetic, intelligent and conscientious. But really her career choice and the social norms at the time of the Asian society at that time, um, the police were not very friendly at the time to the Asian community and it really went against her, against her husband's wishes. Now they separated and the children were taken to live in India. Um, so she had to leave the force, had to go to India to collect her children and bring them back to the UK. And only a few years after um, becoming the first police officer on the 4th of November, 1973, her husband caught up with her um, outside their former house in Walthamstow in East London and where he murdered her. Um, so this year marks the 50th anniversary of her becoming the first Asian policewoman in the UK. And Ravjit Gupta, who is the chair of the Metropolitan Police Sikh Association added, that Kirpal was an invaluable ambassador who helped break down barriers with London communities and will always be remembered for being a trailblazer of her time. So I'm just going to move the story now from London to France. And I'm going to take you to Saint-Tropez in France, in the south of France, a very nice um, place in France. And I'm going to introduce you to Bannu Bande. Now, Bannu Bande story really, 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 really relates back to Maharaja Ranjit Singh. And at that time, if we go back to 1822, um, Maharaja Ranjit Singh had a general called Jean Francois Allard, who was from France. He served in um, Napoleon's um, armies in the Imperial Guard. And after Napoleon was defeated by the British, his generals started to make their way towards finding new employment. Um, and Allard reached Lahore, the capital city of Punjab. There, Maharaj Ranjit Singh soon asked him to undertake modernization of his army, um, which led him to command the Forj Ikas, the special brigade. Now, also at that time, Maharaj Ranjit Singh um, arranged the marriage of Allard to Princess from Jamba. And that princess was Bannu Bande. Um, this couple had seven children and five of those survived. And this statue um, can be found in saint in Allard Square. And it's very close to Allard statue. And there is also a statue of Ranjit Singh in this square. Now, just going back to her husband, General Allard, just in, in line with the choose to challenge theme. Now, Allard obviously had got to Lahore um, and he was all involved in those battles um, with the special command. Now, one day he saw a woman jump onto the pyre of one of his colleagues who had died during a battle. And he began to fear that Pandey would be obliged to commit sati if he dies in the battlefield too. And he did not want her to meet this fate. And so he decided to take her to France and settle in Saint-Tropez. This family made the journey in 1835. Now, their descendants are still um, in Saint-Tropez, and one of their descendants is Henry, Henri Allard. And Henri is the tourism minister in, in um, Saint-Tropez now, which is why you see the connections are building between this history and bringing it to life now. Um, Henri says that Pandey and Allard's marriage um, was really arranged to bolster the relationship between Punjab and France. And, and it's interesting that he also says that General Allard asked her to learn French to maintain the privacy of communication between her in France and him in Lahore. Um, and when she wrote to him, he said, write in Persian. And he also asked his children to speak in Persian and Punjabi because he said French was not their mother tongue, but really to follow their mother tongue. So all of these little interesting histories are told through the families and their descendants. And after his death, um, Pandey actually converted to Christianity. And it was probably, um, it is said, if her way of realizing sati. Yeah, so um, it's interesting. We will do more tours, I think, to France and we will visit Saint-Tropez and, be and beginning to build those connections now. So we're gonna stay in France for the next slide. Um, and this next slide, I'm going to introduce you to Amrita Shergil. Now here, Amrita Shergil um, can be seen um, with her father, Sardar Umrao Singh Shergil in the background. 
Now, Omro married um, Marie Antoinette Cortesman Bakhtai. Now, Marie Antoinette Cortesman Bakhtai was a Hungarian opera singer. They married in 1912 and they, they left and settled in Budapest in Hungary. And soon after their marriage, Amrita and Indra, their two daughters, were born. They left Budapest and they went to Paris in 1929 when Amrita was just 16 years old. She was young, impressionable, and with a passion for art. She would spend the next five years of her life in the city known as the Mecca of the art world. Now, at that time, because of her mother's Hungarian connections, there was a painter by the name of Nemes who had been keeping an eye on Amrita's progress um, at the smaller academies and where she was learning her trade. But eventually, she enrolled at the École Nationale de Beaux Arts. And the École Nationale de Beaux Arts was the primary art institution of Paris at the time. And Amrita was introduced to Professor Lucien Simon. Now, he was a post-impressionist who was quite impressed with her work. Now, Amrita stayed there for three years and she benefited greatly under Simon's um, direction. And just after a few days after her arrival at the Beaux-Arts de Paris, Simon Simon told her that one day I shall be proud that you have been a pupil of mine. And they had these annual competitions with everyone in the institution and Amrita actually won um, the competition every year that she was there for the three years. This was her first painting. It was called A Model in Green. And the theme was not the usual images of the glamorous Parisian lifestyle. Instead, Amrita chose to capture like the sordid underside of the glamorized Parisian life. So I'm gonna hand you back to Sonia to talk about some of her other paintings and some of her art now. Okay. Thanks, Rav. So Amrita, she has been named as India's national treasure. And due to her very short life of 28 years, there are only 172 documented works by her. And the best place to see them is the National Gallery of Modern Art in New Delhi, where 95 of these works are located. Now, some of the pieces that are outside of India is this enigmatic self-portrait, which she painted during her summer vacation in Hungary when she was only 19 years old. In this painting, it is her lips that draw our attention. The intense red color and the hint of a smile playing around them with the mischievous twinkle in her eyes makes this an endearingly charming portrait. Like her other works, the brilliant use of color in the portrait gives this painting an energy and vitality. It is a small painting and it recently sold for something like $3 million. But this is which shows her technical expertise, which she got in Paris. And as Rav shared with us, she always believed that her destiny lay in India. She is said to have mentioned, and I quote, Europe belongs to Picasso, Matisse, and many others, but India belongs only to me, unquote. And so it was. She was encouraged by her teachers who felt that the intensity of her work, the vibrancy of her colors, they would flourish in India, while the dullness of Europe might just wither it. But it was her father, Umrao Singh, who was against her moving back to India because he felt his daughter was too bohemian for conservative India. Nevertheless, she chose to challenge and the rest is history. She left an indelible mark in the art world, pioneering a new form of Indian modernism. And one of her earliest paintings on her return to India is the group of three girls, which was painted in 1934 and is the winner of the gold medal at the Bombay Art Society. The earthy reds and browns of India are reflected in the colors of this painting, the pensive and desolate mood of the three young women who are at once sitting together, yet appearing isolated, became her style for future works. Her figures are mostly always static while the colors are vibrant, glowing and intense. 
And uh, Rav, I know you have some very interesting information regarding this particular painting. Would you like to share it now? Yeah, of course, of course. So actually it was revealed uh, recently, I think in the last decade or so, that the three girls in Amrita's painting here are granddaughters of a landowning politician, Sundar Singh Majithya. And they were actually her cousins. And they've got names. <laughs> the sisters were named Beant Kaur, Narvair Kaur, and Kurbajan Kaur. And they were in their teens. They were just a few years younger than Amrita when they became the subject of her painting. It's hard to believe that just seven years later in Lahore, at the young age of 28, that she died. And we can only imagine that if she lived longer, the heights that she would have reached in the art world. So moving on, we're going to stay now um, with the glamorous people, I think. <laughs> so I'm going, to, I'm going to take this next part of the presentation and move to the Kapoorthala family. And I think I'm going to cover this with London first. Um, so this is Princess Indira Devi of Kapoorthala. Now she was one of the most glamorous women of her time and she featured in the Vogue magazine of the 1930s. She was the eldest daughter of the Maharaja of Kapoorthala. She was an actress, a fashion icon and a London socialite. But she wasn't your average delicate princess. What happened is her ambitions to make a career in the film industry didn't materialize because of the onset of World War II. And then she started to be work as an ambulance driver during air raids. Um, so her career at the Academy of Dramatic Art didn't, didn't materialize. But eventually um, she found herself working for the BBC. And when she worked at the BBC during World War II, she was described, um, she, what she did was do the Hindi broadcast for Indian soldiers. Either they were convalescing in the UK or they were serving in the Middle East. And through the British Broadcasting Corporation, and here we see the image of her doing her weekly um, reports in Hindi for the serving soldiers. And over time, she became known as the Radio Princess. Also, she started to host other programs and she hosted The Debate Continues. Now, this was a program which was all about the Houses of Parliament and she was the only woman in the press gallery at the time. Now she broke several barriers about what was considered appropriate for women, and she was a feminist icon of her time. I'm just gonna move on to other princesses of the Kapoorthala family. Now this one is Princess Garam. Now Princess Garam was um, known as the Pearl of India. She was comfortable in the fashion circles of Paris, New York, and London during the 1920s and 1930s. She spoke several languages, English, German, and French. And at the age of 19, um, she was um, proclaimed as a secular goddess by Vogue. And when she was 22, another magazine named her as one of the best five dressed women in the world. And she became a fixture in the Paris social circles and was often seen in couture pieces by leading designers dripping in Cartier jewels. She was a muse to famous photographers. And she actually inspired Elsa Schiaparelli, who was a famous Italian designer of the time. And Schiaparelli's 1935 collection of evening gowns, which I've shown one of them here, was based on her saris. And I just found it quite interesting that all of the princess portraits that we've seen when they came to Europe they would always be wearing their saris. You know, they didn't conform to modern dress, whereas the male counterparts would come to the UK and be seen in suits, three-piece suits, gentleman suits for their meetings. And I always found it interesting that um, they actually inspired the, the, the designers in Europe to design based on the dress of, of India. I'm just going to move to another one. Um, another Kapoorthala princess, and this one's a Maharani. And we did a whole show on this um, last November, which, which is available on our channels. Um, but this is Anita Delgado Briones. Now she would find herself to become the Maharani of Kapoorthala. And she said um, during her time that I have told of my infancy and childhood thousands of times. And I'm certain those stories will be further repeated to remain on record. And I always find it interesting that we, as the Sikh diaspora community have <laughs> very rarely heard of her. Um, but she accompanied, um, so she was in Madrid when this gentleman on the right, the Maharaja Jagat Deep Singh, um, arrived in Madrid for a royal wedding in the Spanish royal family. 
King Alfonso, I think, um, for the marriage. And during his time in Madrid, his eyes were set upon a dancer, a flamenco dancer, the Cursal, and he courted her. And after a courtship, and they married on the 28th of January, 1908. She went on to become Maharani Prem Kaur Saib of Kapoorkala. She traveled around Europe and India, and I was just discussing, and these paintings actually are found in her hometown of Malaga. So in Malaga, they have the Museo de Artes de Costumbres Populares, the popular customs of the region of Malaga. Um, and just in that one museum there, you have these three huge paintings of their, they call her their Cinderella, because um, she left from a, quite a poverty stricken family in the south of um, Spain, went to Madrid, learned dance, caught the eye of Jagatit Singh, and he whisked her off to Paris, and then took her to India, where she was Maharani Prem Kaur Saiba. And interestingly enough, I think I did put the slide in, yeah. And she wrote a book about all of her time um, in India, Impressions de mi viajes por la Indias. And it's an interesting, I've only got a Spanish copy of this book. Um, I haven't, I don't think it's uh, translated into English, but I'm sure people who, who can read Spanish or can translate Spanish would find this an interesting read of the time. Um, and with that, Benji, I'm gonna hand back to you. Thank you, Rav. So I think from the stories of royalty, uh, we now move to the uh, this poor young peasant woman uh, who was born in 1890 in a small village in Sangrur in Punjab. So this is a painting of Gulab Kaur. She was the leader of the Gadar party in Manila, Philippines. She was married at an early age to a gentleman named Man Singh. And the couple, they moved to Manila in search of a livelihood. And they were actually en route to the United States, but they uh, had to uh, transit in Manila. So there they came in touch with the Gadar activists who were fighting overseas for India's independence. And Gulab Kaur and her husband, they both joined the movement. And she became one of the main organizers, traveling across the Philippines to organize the Indian residents, collecting weapons and money for the party. Now, eventually her husband decided to leave for America, but Gulab Kaur decided otherwise. She left her husband and went back to India along with 50 other Gadarites and in reaching India, she became active in uh, places like Kapoorthala, Hoshiarpur, and Jalandhar. And where also she was mobilizing the uh, masses for armed revolution, distributing literature linked to the freedom movement, and maintaining a vigil on the revolutionary printing press. Unfortunately, she was arrested by the British colonial rulers under sedition charges and imprisoned for two years at Lahore's Shahi Kila, where she underwent serious abuse and torture. And eventually she passed away sometime in 1931. Now, despite her courageous and important contributions to India's freedom struggle, there is not a whole lot of literature documenting her life or other acknowledgements. There are, I believe, two biographies written about her one by Milka Singh, and another is uh, by Kesar Singh, which is titled Gadar Diti. But the most impactful and resurrecting impact of her memory is done visually by the artist Kamal Dhaliwal. And he has done this beautiful, hard hitting portrait, which is based on just one single photograph that we have of Golabko. That is all we have of her. And the artist has taken that portrait and used it in his painting. And again, he has filled it with symbolism. And I will describe this painting in the words of Kamal Dhaliwal himself. And I quote, where the color coded bars of the cell, he, he titles this painting, The Cell, are quite obvious manifestations on whom to blame for her imprisonment the green, saffron, and red flag 
famous tricolor of the Indian freedom fighters and an image of the front page of the magazine Ghadar in Persian script. I painted to establish the most natural relationship between the revolution and the revolutionary, unquote. Now, Gulab Court chose to challenge British colonial rule as well as the social norms by which women were contained in a certain sphere of life only. But she mixed up those spheres and she put herself out there sharing the experiences of her brothers in arms. And her story is reminiscent and directly connected to the role of women today in the farmers protest, which is ongoing in India, where women are in the front lines of the mocha. Now I have a selection of photographs, which I'd like to quickly share with you. Now these pictures were taken by a young photographer. His name is Himan Shudua, who lives very close to the farmers protest site at Tikri. And he shared these images uh, with me and they were really my introduction to the farmers protest. They're watching his photographs is where, how I got pulled in into following and understanding and writing about uh, the protest. So we will quickly scroll through this selection. And as they say, a picture speaks a thousand words. So the next image we have here is a portrait. It's a powerful portrait of Harinder Kaur Bindu. She is the leader of the Bharatiya Kisan Union and is very critical and plays a very critical role in mobilizing and organizing the women at the Morcha. And most of the other pictures like this one are unnamed faces, but collectively they are a force to reckon with. And that has now also made it to the cover of the Time magazine uh, in its Indian edition and also a wonderful article in the piece. And I would like to quote from uh, that article some quotations of what these women are saying to the reporters or to the media of how their image has changed for themselves and for the others. Now, lovingly, they're also called the dadis of the revolution and they are fierce and bold and they're eager to step forward and make their voices heard. Now, first quotation I'd like to read for you is, which is on the uh, cover of the magazine. For the one I have is the US edition, so it's not on the cover, but is in, in the article. But I believe the India, uh, the magazine published in India, it's on the cover. And it says, uh, Kiran Jodhkor uh, says, it is important for all women to come here and mark their presence in this movement. I have two daughters and I want them to grow up into the strong women they see here. And then moving on, uh, there is another quote. The women are asking the questions. We toil in the fields alongside the men. Who are we if not farmers? And this is the amazing thing that is happening. Uh, it's a miraculous thing that these questions are being asked for the first time, I, I think. And not only are the women, but the perception of the men are also changing. In the article, there is a quote from uh, Sukhdeep Singh, and he says, we have known them as mothers, sisters, and wives, but now we see them in a different light. And I unquote. So it's a huge, other than the farm bills that they're trying, but the, uh, the spirit that these uh, protesters are showing is just so inspiring. There is another quote which says, Prime Minister Modi is making us leave our farms and sit here to fight for our rights. We are here to get these laws repealed and we will be here till we get it done. So these are the powerful uh, 
quotes that are coming out from this, uh, the mocha. And with this, uh, I think we have another picture, Raf. Yeah, it's a few more. So these are another, some of the images from there. And this is also one of my favorites. And I'd like to end this presentation with this quote, which says, I cannot talk well, but I can sit tight. And I will sit here till the next elections if these laws are not called out. So this is the inspiration that these women in today's time as we speak are giving us. And with this, I think our, I bring us to the end of our presentation today. And uh, we have thoroughly enjoyed sharing this time with all of the audience. And of course, it's always a pleasure to present with you, Rav. Thank you for inviting me. Well, no, thank you very much. It's been a nice, enjoyable show. I hope everyone's enjoyed it. It'll be available on our channels and we'll get a YouTube version of it out soon. Thank you. So do I, I will see, I don't think we've had many questions. I'll let me check the chat box, but I think a lot of the chat. So right. Rav, I did notice one, there was, um, it's a question also, mm -hmm. uh, and that was from the artist himself, Kamal Dhaliwal. Wow. And uh, this is regarding the pronunciation of Sophia's name. I know, mm. I mean, I grew up in India and I would say her name is Sophia. Mm. Um, so do you have something um, to yes, say so, on that? So I, you know, when I first started these tours, we went to see Sophia's house in Blow Norton. I actually went to her other house last week um, in the village of Penn. Now the spelling is Sophia, S-O-P-H-I-A, but the way it, you have to remember it is S-O and then fire as in flame. So fire is the way um, Peter Bantz has explained it to me. The okay. way other people have explained it to me, it's fire, so fire, not Sophia. Okay. Um, so that's how I remember it um, now. I have made that mistake six years ago and I was pulled up on it on one of my videos. Um, so I went to see Peter and he explained it to me. So that's, yeah. that's how I, <laughs> I I made that as well on one of the posts I did and uh, I had Sophia in my mind and I'm writing S-O-F-I-A, but so he, he pointed that out to me as well. So I've, but that's how I think Sophia is, is what, he's the, the authority on, on the, the authority. I think also I've got my artists, they also went to the village and people have explained that's the way to remember it. So that's, um, okay. you know, so um, I think that answers it. Fire in her belly, so. <laughs> yeah, now that answers this. I do would like to add that, you know, you shared a cover of the book uh, written by um, Anita Delgado. Uh, who became the Maharani Prem Kaur Sahiba of Kapoorthala. Yes. And uh, so perhaps, I mean, we are in California, if there are uh, people watching here, uh, and if you know anyone who knows Spanish, I think this is wonderful if someone can take that initiative to translate this book into English or Punjabi. Um, I think that would be just wonderful. Uh, yes, we do have a tour really in to Madrid. But I still haven't got the confidence to, to contact Elisa Vasquez de Gay, but I will. I hope she speaks English, <laughs> but, uh, but I, I thought it'd be nice when we do a tour that she could do a, a presentation in the evenings in the hotel. But, um, but I will do that. I will use Google Translate and <laughs> see. Wonderful. Uh, Wonderful. And I also want to give a shout out to uh, Priya Atwal, who has written this wonderful book, uh, Rebels and Royals. And it was for the first time that I, uh, when I read through it, I was, I was just blown away because I have never read a history book in which a name of a woman comes 20 times on one page. Uh, it's always like two times in the whole book maybe. <laughs> so she has taken that lens and retold the story of the empire uh, through the women and really highlighting the the untold stories or just the perceptions or the social norms which have made it the mighty empire that we we like we are so proud of so where all those of how uh, the women were uh, trained uh, growing up in administrative work and how they stepped in to take care of the principalities 
And uh, there is so much more that is out there, which I'm hoping will keep coming out. Priya has taken uh, the step and I'm sure there will be others uh, who will also follow. And perhaps one day we can do an uh, entire show on the Patiala family because there have been some amazing, incredible women who, have, uh, who are really the ones by which the dynasty has survived today. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, it's really wonderful, yeah. I think Amrita and Ravindra are on the call as well, just saying you can guess who drew the cover for that mag for the book. Of course, of course, <laughs> yes, our so beloved sure. Singh twins. Yeah, so that's the, they're on yes. the cover. And I know Priya's good friends with them as well. So that's brilliant. Wow. Now, I think, are we up to time now? Oh, yeah, a few more minutes. So uh, do we have any comments? We can, we can, I think, um, we can conclude yeah, and, now. The yeah. has made another comment about the leap. And I think, yes, he's probably right. But I think with the leap, I've seen so many spellings of the name the leap Singh, Duleep, as he was known by Queen Victoria, Duleep. Um, but the leap is probably the Punjabi. Um, right. right. It's probably in Lahore. Yeah. Um, but I have about eight different spellings of the leap Singh. <laughs> right, right. In different documents behind me. So. Yeah, my son is is the leap Singh, but he writes uh, D A L E E P. Yeah, the leap. So yeah. The different versions. So I see one of the comments. Uh, somebody has uh, written that they've already sent uh, the cop the book information, mm -hmm. the Spanish book information to uh, someone they know who speaks Spanish. So I think that uh, I I'm really excited to see if something. Yes, yeah, so I have. To, I said Dean's Dean's done. She she does comment often on little history, but I have the book, um, and because I can get part in a little bit of Italian, I can make it out. Um, but you can buy it through the Spanish Amazon. You can't buy it on the British Amazon or the US Amazon yet. So it's kind of like a Spanish book okay. in Spain. But okay. I'll get more copies when I'm in Spain again and we'll take it from there. So I think we can, um, we can sign everyone. off now, yeah. I think so, thank you. Thank you everyone for your comments, uh, building a little community now. <laughs> yeah, thank you everyone. And uh, for taking the time to be with us, the recording will be available on the Sikh Foundation's uh, YouTube channel. Rav, do you also carry it somewhere on your... Uh... Yeah, I'll, I'll put it on mine, but I normally okay. reference yours okay. first. <laughs> yeah, so please, um, uh, it was wonderful presenting with you. And I think just in conclusion, uh, what I would like to say is like too often, women have been unsung heroes and many times their contributions have gone unnoticed and uh, unacknowledged. But more and more, we are coming to appreciate and acknowledge the vital role and achievements, leadership, courage, strength, and the love of women in our history, whether it is in, in our family or nation building, whether in art and literature and all the other realms of life. So thank you for your contributions. Thank you for watching us. And thank you to Tanmeet and Ms. Cosma and Tarun for helping us get this show uh, to you. Sashrikan.